In this chapter, we're going to be discussing long-term liabilities. The term long-term simply means, in general, that the liability will not be paid off for more than one year. Now, with long-term liabilities, you can have a current portion of them and then the long-term portion. So you might have a mortgage, for example. If you own a house, you have a mortgage that's probably very long-term, but every year you're going to owe a current amount. So you do owe it each month and then, of course, each year. That first year that you're currently in will be considered current, but the rest of it will be long-term. So the general rule is we're talking about liabilities that won't be paid off for more than one year. So we have a few different liabilities we could talk about. We could talk about notes payables, long-term notes payables. There's really no difference between what we discussed with current liabilities and short-term notes payable and what we're going to talk about today with the longer-term liabilities. So the notes payables are the same. They still have interest. They're still formal. The only difference is exactly how long are they going to be paid off? How long is it going to take them to be paid off? With bonds, this is something that you generally see in a company's long-term notes or a long-term liability section. A bond, you hear the term stock and bond, and you tend to maybe think they're very similar things. And in reality, they are, in a way, kind of the exact opposite. With a stock, for example, you are having someone else invest in your company to become part owner. With a bond, that person is lending you money. They are not becoming part owner of your company. They're lending you money. So it's, it's very similar to going to the bank and borrowing money. The big difference is you're borrowing from a bunch of smaller creditors and you're issuing them a bond. You're going to pay them interest and you're going to pay them their money back. They do not become owners of your company. So it, from the company's point of view, one of the advantages of issuing bonds to get financing, to get money to grow your company or start your company, is that bonds do not affect stockholder control. So any stockholders you do have, they don't lose any control over the company. Their ownership is not diluted. It's very similar to borrowing money from a bank. You just have, have a new creditor now. A big benefit is that the interest you have to pay on the bonds, the interest expense, is tax deductible. Unlike dividends for equity for stock, which is not tax deductible. Now this other advantage, it, it can go both ways. The advantage is that the bonds can increase the return on equity. Now what we're saying here, we have return on investment, also known as return on assets, and then we have return on equity. The return on investment or assets is basically your company's entire return based on whatever they have that was invested in the company, whatever assets you have regardless of how you purchase them. So that's all your investments borrowed money as well as invested money through stocks. The return on equity is just the return that accrues to the shareholders. So the return that's related to their investment, how much money they're going to get as a return. So from the stockholder or the owner's point of view, they're more concerned with return on equity. How much are they going to get? Now the good news is bonds can increase that. The reason is if you borrow money, let's say at 5%, and you're able to use that money to grow the company, buy new equipment, sell more product, and generate a return of, let's say, 12%, let's just take an extreme example, that's positive financial leverage. So you're borrowing money at 5%, you're generating a return at 12%. It's really, you can boil it down to saying, hey, I borrow 5% money at the bank, I go invest in a stock, and it guarantees me 12%, or a, another bond, it guarantees me 12%. That's a great deal. If you can get that situation without any big risk, then you'd want to take it. You're getting positive financial leverage. So it can go that way. It can go the other way, as we'll see in a bit. If the company borrows money at 10% and they're only able to use it to generate 7% return, that's not a good idea. That's negative financial leverage. So that's what we're talking about over here. Probably the biggest disadvantage of a bond is that it puts you in a situation where you have to pay the money back, obviously. There's no surprise there. You pay the money back at the end of the bond's life, but you also have to pay periodic interest, generally every six months or so. So that's a situation you want to be aware of. The more money you borrow, the more interest you're going to have to pay. So what happens with a bond issuance? When the company needs to borrow money 
and they don't want to just go to the bank to get that money, they may sell the bonds to an investment firm that's called an underwriter. The, the underwriter does all the book work, they do all the legwork, all that, to get this ready to sell to investors. Then, of course, they do sell it to investors, and there's going to be an external entity, a trustee, that monitors this bond issue to make sure everything follows the regulations. Because you want to make sure those investors are protected, you want to make sure the company's not trying to sell bogus bonds or sell them without uh, following all the rules. Nothing really to that. The basics of bonds as far as finances go, you have the corporation. Well, first, actually, you have the investors that are going to give the money to the corporation through the underwriter. But now the corporation has to pay interest payments generally every six months, maybe every year. And the way we calculate those is we're taking the par value of the bond times the stated interest rate, also known as the coupon rate or the contract rate, whatever is listed on that actual bond. So here in this example, the par value is a million dollars. Stated interest rate is 10%. It's going to pay interest on June 30th and December 31st. The bond date in this example is January 1st, 2009. It's going to mature 20 years later, December 31st, 2028. So in this case, the debit will go to cash for a million. The credit will go to bonds payable for a million. It's just basically saying we have cash coming in and now we know we owe money in the future. So now what we have to consider is when we're going to pay that interest expense off. So in our last example, the June 30th, 2009 would be the first semi-annual interest payment. Semi-annual simply means every six months, twice a year. So here our entry is going to be a debit to interest expense for 50000 and we'll talk about that amount in a bit. We're crediting cash because we're paying cash out. So here the entry is going to be, for that $50,000, it's going to be calculated by taking a million dollars, the par value of that bond, not necessarily the selling price of the bond, the par value, and we'll see that in a bit. We're going to multiply that par value times the stated interest rate, the interest rate that is on the bond, the coupon rate, uh, stated rate, contract rate, three different terms for the same thing. This is the rate that's printed on the bond. It's not the market rate. We'll talk about that later. That's how we price the bond. In any case, we're going to multi multiply that by the percentage of the year we're dealing with. This is an annual rate, so if we don't have exactly one year, we have to multiply it by the percentage of the year that we do have. Six months, of course, is half a year, so we're multiplying it by half, one half, or 50%. We get $50,000 there. Now, 20 years later, on December 31st, 2028, we've been paying all this interest all along. Now, at the very end, the only thing we have left to do is pay off the bond itself. We debit bonds payable for that full $1 million. We credit cash for that same $1 million, and it's cleared out. They use the term extinguished. We've eliminated the liability. So now, that was an easy example where the bond was issued at par. So the par value that we had was exactly the price that we issued that bond at. That doesn't always happen. There's usually a uh, difference with the actual uh, rate, the contract rate and the market rate. So in this example, we're actually we're going to see all three. When the contract rate, the interest rate that we pay interest on, the interest rate we pay cash interest on, when that is above the market rate, by the way, the market rate, the easiest way to explain that is it's the average of what everybody else is paying for that same type of bond. That's considered the market rate. When we are paying above the market rate, so we as a company are paying more interest than everybody else is on average, that's a great investment for a, a bond investor. They will be flooding to us. They want that higher interest rate. So to help, uh, to help equalize that, to get it to an equilibrium where the supply of the bonds matches up with the demand, the price will rise. So the bond will sell at a premium. So in our example, our par value is a million dollars. We're probably going to sell it for maybe a million fifty, a million fifty thousand dollars. We're going to sell a little bit higher because of the fact that we're paying more interest. It's a great investment. 
we expect you to pay a little more interest or more up front to buy this bond and then we'll pay you this higher interest rate. Now the par value is what we're going to pay back at the end of this bond's life. So even if you pay a million fifty thousand dollars right now, we're only going to be paying you back one million dollars down the road. So that's where the par value comes into play. But we need to know the price too. What is it selling at? So if the contract rate that we're paying interest on is higher than what everybody else is paying interest on, we're going to sell this for a higher price. It's a great investment. If the two equal, we're paying exactly what everybody else is for interest, we're going to sell it right at its par value. If we're selling it at a lower interest rate than what everybody else is paying on average, we're going to have to give you a discount on this bond, otherwise nobody will want to buy it. So now a discount, that simply means that we have a million dollar bond, we're only going to charge you maybe $950,000. And then again, even though you only paid $950,000, at the very end of this bond's life, we will pay you back that par value of $1 million, no matter what. So let's take a look at some examples here. So here we're going to prepare the entry for January 1, 2009 to record the following bond issue by Rose Company. The par value of this bond is a million dollars. The issue price, first of all, it's often given in a percentage format. So here the issue price is 92.6405% of par value. The stated interest rate, the rate printed on the bond is 10%. The market interest rate is 12%. So we are paying less than everybody else is on average. That's what we're basically saying here. The bond is going to have to sell at a discount because nobody else is going to buy our bond if we're paying less interest unless we sell it at a discount. By the way, if you're given the issue price, in this case 92.6405%, right away that tells you it's a discount because it's less than 100%. If it was 100% exactly, we'd be selling right at par and our two rates would match up perfectly. They give us the interest dates. It's still going to be 630 and 1231. The bond date is January 1, 2009. It's going to mature five years later, December 31, 2013. So first of all, what we're going to see this shown as on the balance sheet. We're going to have the bonds payable. It's going to be under the long-term liability section. It's going to be under the bonds payable for the full million dollars. This will always be reported at the par value. But then we're going to subtract out the discount on bonds payable. Whatever it happens to be at that point. We'll see that over time this gets reduced as we count more interest expense. And we amort we'll say we're amortizing this discount. We'll talk about that in a bit. This amount gets reduced. But in any case, we take the bonds payable less the discount. That gives us the carrying value. And this, over time, will get closer and closer to this $1 million as we use up this discount. That's what we're talking about down here, amortizing this discount. So using the straight line method, the discount amortization will be $7,360 every six months. The way we calculated that straight line, it's just very similar to the depreciation, straight line depreciation. Amortization and depreciation, by the way, they're the same concept, they're just used, the two different terms are used differently depending on what we're trying to, what cost we're trying to spread out. But in any case, we take 73595 that's our discount, our total discount, and we want to spread it out over 10 periods, 10 six-month periods. So we get $7,360, we round it up. So we have two different methods that are common. We have the straight line method and we have something called the effective interest method. The amount of interest over time is going to be the same. Your total amount over the entire life of the bond is going to be the same. It's just a question of which period gets more interest. So what happens here at the, in the first years, you're going to have a little bit less interest and as time goes on, your interest expense is going to get higher and higher and higher. So let's take a look at the premium side of this. Same details, it's a par value of a million. The issue price is 108.1145. So you can tell right away it's a premium, it's higher than 100%. The stated interest rate there is 10%. We are paying 10% on this bond. The market interest rate is only 8%. So everybody else is only paying 8. We're paying more than everybody else. We're going to sell this at a premium because it's a great deal for the investors. 
We have the interest dates. We know the bond date and the maturity date. Now, this one's it's still going to be the same format on the balance sheet. The only difference is now we're adding in a premium of 81145 and our what this is, this is called the carrying value over here. It's the subtotal, in this case, of bonds payable plus the premium. So just with the discount, the premium is going to get reduced over time through this amortization. As we reduce that, this carrying value reduces closer and closer to $1 million. By the end of this bond's life, this carrying value should equal $1 million exactly. Same thing for the calculation. We're taking the total premium, dividing it by the number of periods. And then at bond retirement, we're going to debit bonds payable for a million and credit cash for a million as well. Now, this next slide that I wanted to show you is regarding the, the entries kind of from start to from the start where we issue the bond all the way to the actual uh, interest expense. We just talked about in this last slide what the retirement looks like, but before we even get to that point, and I'll jump back to that slide in a bit, uh, we want to take a look at how do we set this up if we do have a discount or premium, and how do we record the journal entry. So let's take a look at the discount first of all. When we issue that, it's not just going to be a debit to cash, credit to bonds payable, because the amounts don't match. The debit to cash will be less than the credit to bonds payable because of the fact that we issued it at a discount. So what we're going to have to do here, the cash in this case, in my example, it's, it was issued at 95000 So we're going to have a $5,000 shortage in our debits. We're $5,000 short. We know we need them to uh, balance out. So the extra debit is going to go to an account called discount on bonds payable. That's one way to set it up. Discount on bonds payable, 5000 Now our debits and credits balance out. Now the interest payment, we're going to have a debit to interest expense, and we'll talk about that amount in a bit. That's not necessarily going to be the amount we pay. Then we're going to have a credit to cash for the amount that we are truly paying. This would be our actual coupon rate or contract rate, the amount we said we would pay to them in interest times the par value. So there would be a thousand dollars cash credited. Now the discount, we talked about amortizing that discount. That's exactly what we're doing here. In my example, let's say it was a 10 year, 10 year bond. No semi-annual payments, just 10 periods, 10 years, 10 periods. So we take a thousand And I'm sorry, actually, in this example, I was looking at the wrong thing. We have to look at the discount. The total discount was 5000 so we want to figure out how much discount do we have each period. Now, in this case, let's assume it was 25 years semi-annual payment. So forget what I said a second ago. It's a 25-year bond, but it has two periods per year, semi-annual, so it's 50 periods. So we're taking 5000 divided by 50 periods to get $100 per period. So that credit to discount gives us $100 here. The interest expense is going to be the, the total or the sum of those two credits. So we have to record interest expense of 1100 What this tells us is that when we use up a discount, that increases our interest expense above and beyond what we pay in cash. So now let's jump to the premium side. Sorry for the skip there. I had to switch this out. As you probably noticed, the, uh, the, the amount paid or the amount uh, per charged for this bond on issuance, it, was, it shouldn't have been uh, the amount that was originally there. It should be 105000 in this case. It's a premium, so you know you're going to get more cash than your actual bonds payable is set up at. So in this example, we had a bonds payable of 100000 that's the par value, and there was a premium of 5000 For some reason, it was issued at a higher price. So we debit cash for the 105000 So that clears this up a bit. Now, the interest payment. In this case, we're going to credit cash for the same $1,000 that we did with the discount, but we're going to have a smaller interest expense. In this case, it's going to be less than the cash payment. 
it's going to be less by $100. That $100 will be the amortization of our premium. So what you can see here is when you amortize a premium, that reduces your interest expense. So that takes us through the, uh, no, actually, let me back up here. So I want to talk about this slide as well again. We talked about the bond issuance, the bond interest expense. Now, if we have retired those bonds at maturity, that means we've amortized all of the premium that we need. So since we've cleared off the premium and discount, that means we have the debit to bonds payable for just the premium, or I'm sorry, just the uh, par value, because that's all that's left, $1 million and we credit cash for a million as well. Now here's the key thing, if we do retire this bond before the maturity, we're still going to have some discount or premium left that has not been amortized. So that's where the trouble comes in. If our carrying value is greater than the reti retirement price, so whatever we have to pay to retire this bond, if our carrying value is higher than that, then we got a good deal. It showed that we still owed basically uh, let's say one million fifty thousand but we got a good deal we only paid one million twenty five thousand to pay it off so we have a gain we paid less than it was valued at on our books and since it's a liability we don't really want to pay all that much the carrying value if it's less than the retirement price we're gonna have a loss for the exact opposite reason again if it's retired at bond or if the bond is retired at maturity then the carrying value will equal its par value. There won't be a gain or a loss. So the next topic for the last few slides here is long-term notes payable. So this is where the company borrows money from just one lender. Instead of a bunch of bondholders, they borrow from one lender. It could be a bank, whatever. They're going to have to borrow the money, and they're going to make regular payments of principal plus interest. So they have a couple ways of doing this. They could make equal principal payments plus whatever interest is due at that point, which means the payments themselves are going to change over time. The total payments will be the same, but the payments themselves will change. Or they might make equal payments. Some portion of its principal, some portion is interest. When you have a mortgage, for example, usually you take this second route. Your payments don't generally change. You take this equal payment. Your first payment is going to be most all of it will be interest and then over time it'll get more and more principal. So we have a few types of mortgage notes, a few types of bonds you could talk about here. You could have a secured bond or an unsecured bond. Secured means it's secured by some sort of collateral. Unsecured means it's based solely on credit. A term bond is just one bond that has a 10-year term. It's due in 10 years. Serial is generally a collection of several bonds and they have different due dates so it makes it look like it's kind of an installment one bond is due in one year the next bond is due at year two the next one's year due at year three so it makes it look like one huge bond that's due with payments over time a registered bond simply means that uh, you know the owner you know exactly who should own this who you should pay it off the bearer bond is basically whoever physically has that bond at that point gets the money it can be transferred without any paperwork, basically. A bearer bond is uh, easily transferable. Convertible bond is where you can convert this. The bondholder can decide they want to convert this to become a part owner of the company, common stock generally. A callable bond means that the company themselves can call this off early by paying a certain amount to the bondholder. Now the last slide we have here is basically our ratio for debt. It's the debt to equity ratio. We're comparing debt, liabilities, to equity. So we want to see how risky is it, what is our financing mix. So the higher the debt to equity ratio, that means you have more debt financing versus equity. That's more of a concern. It might be a risk, but if you do it right, it might be good. Because If you're borrowing at a low rate and you're generating a higher return, we talked about positive financial leverage earlier. That would be a good thing. The, the last slide we do have, I guess, I uh, skipped this slide, accruing bond interest expense. So our payment dates don't always match up with our fiscal year end. So in this example, they have uh, apparently a 1231 fiscal year end, December 31st. 
but their bonds were due April 1st and October 1st. So we have to take a look at that interest expense. If you recall adjusting entries where we're accruing interest, here we're taking a look January 1st, all the interest that's due up through April 1st is paid on that day, April 1st. Then we have all the interest, finally it's paid on October 1st. On that next day, October 2nd basically, we start accruing more interest because we're borrowing money, but guess what? We're not going to pay it again until April. That's past December 31st. We have to cross December 31st. So we know that we have three months of interest that we need to accrue, but we're not going to actually pay it until April. We have to make an adjusting entry at December 31st to recognize that three months worth of interest. This is no different than the adjusting entry we've, that has been discussed in earlier chapters. We just have to accrue that interest. It's a debit to interest expense, credit to interest payable for whatever amount you need to accrue. That takes us to the end of this chapter. If you have any comments or questions on this topic, feel free to let me know and I'll be glad to help out. Thanks for your time and I will talk to you in the next session.